Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a, a 25 pound plate, and we'll go out on the turf, and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chop Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeefrey, and this is episode number 283. I want to thank you guys for coming each week. Really appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. It just helps us continue to highlight the great people that we have in the profession. Also, want to thank our sponsors and specifically VersaPulley for bringing this episode to you for free. I only partner with companies that I believe in, both the people and the product. Um, and the product is fantastic, but Kirsten and the gang is um, just, you know, they're top notch. So if you're in the market, reach out to them. If not, uh, you know, just let them know how much you appreciate them at the next conference that you see them at or, or whatever. This week, I'm joined by a friend of mine, Aubrey Watts. She is now the coaching education coordinator for the United States Olympic Committee. I've known her for probably the all 10 years of her career, and she's doing phenomenal things out there. So appreciate you coming out on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Coach. All right, let's talk a little bit. Um, you know, you, you were, I think, if I remember correctly, started at a, at a Velocity and then obviously the uh, at, at NSCA and now at the USOC. Um, so, I mean, you know, great experiences and, you know, the, the, especially the NSCA, it, it, it's such a varied experience because you you're, you're, you got your hands in so many cookie jars um, there. But which – which job, which experience stood out to you the most, made the biggest impact on you as a coach? So, um, I mean, I would definitely have to say the the NSCA working working there under Scott Caulfield was just a once in a lifetime experience. Um, I mean, talk about having an amazing mentor and, you know, teaching you everything from the X's and O's of coaching, which it's like, yes, you get, but then really the networking piece and the kind of culture that he creates um, for his staff is pretty, is pretty unique. Well, we're definitely going to have to go and edit all the good stuff about Scott Caulfield out of this. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's yeah, great, great kinda... guy, doing phenomenal things. And <laughs> but what, you know, in that experience, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. I mean, in that experience, was there a moment, was there a specific conference or group that came through or, or anything along those lines that really stood out to you to say, Hey, this is, you know, this is, you know, not everybody gets to do this. Um, probably yeah, my first coaches conference, um, sitting in the room, you know, at being, having a seat at the table with, you know, people like yourself, the, you know, the big dogs of the, of the industry and just thinking to myself, oh my gosh, how did I get here? I am the stupidest person in this room. But that's really when I knew that I was in the right room though. So, what? I mean, like, it just propelled my growth as a coach. And I mean, that's kind of how I felt starting at this position as well. Like I was like, I am definitely the stupidest person in this room again. So I, I knew that it was the right spot for me to just continue, continue my career for sure. I think that's, I think, I think that's a great point for the young coaches that are listening is, is it's not, I mean, by far, you're not, you know, she's, you're by not far, not the dumbest person in any of those rooms, but the, um, but you want to put yourself as a young, as a coach, as a young coach or a coach in general, in, in positions where you feel, you know, challenged, you know, and, and to grow, you know, and, and, and if you don't grow, you die in this profession. And um, so important to continually to put yourself there. And I mean, you had a great job at the NSCA, probably could have stayed there forever, but you know, you challenged yourself to go on and, 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 and create something that, that where, where they needed it the most, you know, and, and, um, and so it, it's really cool to see what you're doing before we get into that, to that specific job though. I always like to ask because I think it's it's important for young coaches to hear, you know, what your biggest mistake was. What's been, what's been the biggest mistake that you've made in your career and how you learned from it? And I ask that because, you know, as a coach, it's if you can avoid the mistakes that you know people like yourself and me that have made in our careers, if you can avoid those potholes, then hopefully you can get to the destination a little bit quicker. You know, and that's the way that I always looked at it. So. 
what was one of those mistakes that you had and, and what you learned from it? Yeah, um, I, I laugh because I can think of just a hundred mistakes, you know, um, that I've made throughout my career. Some very small, like, oh, man, that exercise was way too soon for this athlete to, you know, something bigger, like, you know, planning the uh, registered strength and conditioning coach conference and not double checking my work enough to and just totally messing up on one of the events I hosted. But I think the biggest, I mean, the one thing that I've learned from these, these mistakes, big and small, is that, I mean, you have to be able to make mistakes. So I think about, um, you know, like a mistake I thought is that you have to be perfect. But I mean, if you only do what you're already good at, you're not progressing and you want to be pushing yourself, pushing your athletes to failure. I mean, whether they're, you know, actual failure or just perceived failure of, sure. so, so you're not keeping perfection because you want to train to succeed, but also train to fail. I mean, that's something that the, um, I heard, uh, a coach say who came from a, you know, the Navy SEALs background where they need to know <coughs> how to keep going when things are going wrong. So. No doubt. Well, it's, it, you know, knowing you like I do, you know, I know you come from a gymnastics background and the whole point of that sport is to get a 10, right? You know, and yeah. have a perfect score. And uh, I would imagine early in your career chasing that perfection, you know, went beyond just, you know, the normal drive of a strength coach. It was probably a little bit intoxicating, a little bit, you know, um, uh, you know, extreme at times, you know, uh, being a gymnast, you know, talk a little bit about, uh, you, you and I have talked before about, you know, really kind of finding yourself um, before you feel like you can really help anybody else. Um, so, yeah, so like really kind of understanding how how you lead and how you like to communicate and how, how you operate um, is going to help you not only be transparent and be yourself around your athletes and your other, you know, fellow, fellow coaching staff, but it's, it's going to help you identify like others' preferences as well. So, I mean, we just did a, a project here at the USOC with our, co with our coaching education staff of really digging deep into our personal values, our personal passions, and what drives us and our goals, and then how it fits back into our team's mission statement and values and goals and drives. So... Really, it's like knowing how knowing your preferences will then help you identify others and how you come back and work as a team. Because um, I, I heard this quote somewhere and I absolutely loved it. It was, "Don't treat people the way that you want to be treated, but treat them the way that they want to be treated." So right. it's kind of about that that agility. Like you don't have to change your values, but how others perceive you can be altered by how you kind of, you know, keep agility within yourself. Yeah. It's uh, you know, it's the gold, you know, the golden rules treat others like you want to be treated. The platinum rule is to treat others like they want to be treated. Yeah. exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I'm getting over a cold here. Um, but I, I really like that. I mean, I think, you know, as a coach, you have to put the time in uh, to, find yourself and, 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 and until then I think you can model the mentors that you've had I mean I think you can you can try to be um, a, an extension of them to some degree but for you to be great you have to find your own way you have to find your own voice your own personality and a lot of that you know what what it's hard for coaches to realize is a lot of that comes from being vulnerable and exposing both your strengths and your weaknesses you know and Absolutely. Uh, sharing those with, with your athletes. You know, when you were that young coach and you were that, you know, that, that perfectionist gymnast that came in and you were trying to do everything, you know, what were some of the steps that you took early to try to, to have your own type of voice? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's like, I'm never going to be Scott Caulfield. So, but learning from, you know, your mentors and, taking bits and pieces that fit with, again, your 
personal values that you relate to is kind of how how you can keep moving forward. I mean, because I think about like I loved concepts of, you know, Brian Mann and Matt Winning and yourself. And it's like all these big names. And then it's like, but I'm never going to be those people. But I can take things that I like from how they that align with, you know, my my stuff and then relate it back in my own way. Because it's just, I mean, it's like, do you does like what you do every day align come back to you know, your, the culture that you want and your values. No doubt. No doubt. I think it's an important step. And, and if you, if you read outside of in business books um, or entrepreneurial books, they'll talk about social proofing and that's, that's what that is, right? That's mm -hmm. finding mentors that align with what you believe. And when you don't have, you know, the, 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 you know, the brand or the name yet, you know, positioning yourself with those mentors and saying, Hey, you know, Cal Dietz says this, um, I believe this and he's got X number of rings, you know, in his, in his office or whatever, you know, not only are you getting your point across, but you're also aligning it with somebody else. That's going to, you know, if, they, if they're going to qu question your qualifications, they probably won't question that person's qualifications. And that's a way to kind of, uh, to fake it till you make it to some degree. But at the same time, it's, it's, um, it's smart to sit back and say, what do I believe in? You know? Um, yeah. And making sure, you know, like they're, they're transparent. Cause you don't want to say like, yeah, I have my values and my goals and, and, and my passions, but then nobody ever knows them. So it's kind of what you said, like to be that vulnerable, to be vulnerable and let people know like, Hey, this is what I truly care about. No doubt. No doubt. Well, the role that you're in now, I mean, obviously coach education is a major part of it, you know, but it's not something that you just have as a title. It's something that you believe in through and through that as a coach, you have to continually sharpen the sword and, and, and challenge your ideals and um, talk a little bit about why you think it's important beyond just the obvious of maybe getting smarter or, um, you know, helping your athletes or helping you get a job, but what, what's, why is it so important to continue to, to um, go after continuing education. Yeah, so I mean, looking at, like taking this job for instance, like completely eye-opening to, cause I had no idea what I didn't know at that time, you know? So it's like stepping outside of your own circle and kind of like what you said, like you like read a leadership book, but then also read a business book and then read a strength and conditioning book. But you don't always have to be studying the X's and O's and thinking about growth and development for our athletes. Like we're trying to always push them a little bit further, uh, whether that's, you know, performing under pressure or getting, hitting a, a bigger number on your squat. But it's, it's about growth and development for ourselves as well. And um, looking at it from a holistic approach too, because looking, I mean, we talk about well-being for our athletes and making sure that they have everything that they need, whether it's like the proper workouts, the sports medicine st side of it, the nutrition, the, you know, meditation, mindfulness, all of it. But are we doing that for ourselves as well? So, I mean, exploring mastery because it's not just a destination but it's like a journey through trying to get like it's through life you know like right yeah no i think it's I mean, it's such a important message there and digging into that a little bit is that holistic approach and i think that that's i mean it's kind of what i wrote about in my book right i mean either you know strength coaches spend so much time in that technical that technical stage that technician stage where all they think about all they talk about all they read about is the sets and reps and programs and you know they're the guys that spend hours and hours on an excel spreadsheet and, and get pissed off when there's a one little mistake yeah, and absolutely. the reality is is anytime that you spend time in that big chair and you're the leader the x's and o's part of strength and conditioning is the simplest part i mean that's the part where you just give me the back of a napkin and i can write you a, a good workout that's not hard exactly. The hard part is getting people to believe in it, to buy into it, to want to do it, uh, to give you great effort, you know, and, um, and and all those things. And 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 so you have to challenge it. And, that's, and, it, and the reality is, is that it's not what we go to school for. Yeah, we go to school exactly. for the reps. You know, we don't necessarily go to school for the 
the, the human condition. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have to improve ourselves on that. And so that coach education um, challenges you to think outside the box, challenges you to, to learn from other disciplines yeah. um, and, um, you know, find ways of attacking common problems in, in that space. So I agree with you hundred percent. I think you got to get outside of your, your bubble to learn. Um, yeah. But then really, um, you know, force yourself to continue to do that. You know, and I asked you off camera, you know, but you're in, a, in the position you're in, um, you know, coach education, you're a strength coach in a coach education role, but the, really the people that you're talking to are the sport coaches. And, mm-hmm. you know, by, you know, traveling the world like I do and working with teams around the world, most of the world, their sport coaches have a, a physical education, at least a lot of times an exercise science degree, and they have an understanding. In the United States, it's not the case. You know, most of them are just former athletes that majored in whatever was going to give them the yeah. most time for their sport. You know, and all of a sudden now they're they're leading you know practices and, and whatnot. And so, mm-hmm. I think what would your advice be? Because I think this is you know as I was preparing for this for this podcast, I, I started thinking about you know like we really need to develop some sort of system for not just the you know, Olympic sports, which the USC has identified, but the NCAA to create, you know, to, to bring in an awareness to the, really the value of a strength coach or, or the, the value of sports science and integrating that into, into practices and game prep and all those things. But what would your advice be to the NCAA to start that process? Yeah, I mean – we're not just doing like strength. And I say we, as in like strength coaches, we are not just doing a job. Like this is a profession. So, I mean, the, they should, strength coaches should absolutely be part of the conversation. They are equally as important as the sport coaches. And that's not to say, you know, to the strength coaches that they are the end all be all, but they should be part. They should have a seat at the table. They should be included uh, on the team. And I mean, everybody I think should be working together because they all have the same common goal here, which is to do right by the athletes and, you know, keep them safe and make them better. Yeah. Grow. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it starts with the conversation, right? You got to have the conversation with those sport coaches and say, you know, Hey, look, maybe, Maybe you should go to this conference, or maybe we should go together to this conference. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, Including, yeah. To- I mean, the it's funny because I I go to when I was at the NSCA going to the conferences there, sitting in to the special interest group meetings. It's like you know the figure skaters think that they have this small problem and it's their problem and it's so specific. Then you go to the college coach meeting and they're having the same exact problem, but they think it's at their level and they're the only ones that are having this problem. And then now coming here and hearing these sport coaches talking from our you know national team level coaches, they're having the same problems. So getting everybody in a room and talking and getting outside of that circle again, I mean, it's like you don't know that everyone's fighting the same fight. Everyone's trying to solve the same problems. And so, you know, four heads are better than one. So, yeah. you know, get yeah. it, get everybody together. Well, one of the things that you did a, a fantastic job of just watching you from afar, but also, you know, self admittedly saying that this is part of the reason why you got the current position, but networking, you know, when you had the opportunity to be around, um, to be at the NSCA, I mean, we all we we both know coaches that have been there before that didn't build nearly the network that you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you intentional about that? Like, what advice would you have for the young coaches listening to start to develop a network and curate that over time instead of just saying, "Okay, I, I met Ron McKeefrey when he came through one day." You know, we built a relationship. You know, you built a relationship yeah. with Matt Wynn and you built a relationship with Boyd Epley you know, guys like that. What what advice did you have or did you have a system that you used to try to, to foster that? Yeah, so, I mean, kind of like you said, I mean, the relationships is a huge piece and that fits my personality where maybe some other people, they don't connect like that. And, but like to me, like I want to ask you, you know, how your kids are and what was your favorite vacation spot and some things that are outside of 
the industry so that you connect with me not just as like a, a colleague but as a, a friend almost or you know a little bit more than just a, a an acquaintance so they'll know that I love to hit the mountains and then have a craft beer afterwards and uh, but I mean it's it was great having because it's like you can't like the master of networking is definitely Scott Caulfield. And he's, I mean, learning from him and seeing how he connects with people uh, is, was absolutely amazing. And so that's like right where I figured out, like I need to be doing this as well. And I mean, it's all about follow-ups. Like for instance, I just, we just had a um, conference at, with some small, with a small group of coaches at the Red Bull headquarters. And I met the high performance director over there, Pear. Yeah. And he, and so hearing what they did, it's like, I'm not looking for a new job at all right now, but like Red Bull high performance, like that was, that was a really cool opportunity to see what they're doing. So I sent a follow up email and I said, Hey, if you ever need any volunteers or you ever, you know, like want to bounce ideas off over, like, how do you do this? And I, I liked this piece of the presentation and he was happy to send back emails. And so we have been exchanging ever since. So, I mean, you look at, at like a small, you know, meeting with somebody and it can turn into a great relationship down the line. Yeah. I, I, I think what you said at the very beginning you know, and, and talk about things outside of the industry is so important because I mean, you know, when the, when a young, you know, as a, as a head strength coach or as an influencer in the space, you know, those types of things. I mean, when you come up to a Cal Deeds and all you want to talk about is triphasic, like he's talked about it so much so he's blue in the face that it's about the last thing he wants to talk about. Right. Yeah. But if you came up and you talked about hockey or you talked about, you know, uh, his kids or, you know, yeah. whatever his, you know. his story, you know, yeah. you know, that, that's going to be so much more memorable for a guy like that. Um, and you're going to stand out. And I think, I think you do have to create some sort of process, whether that's, you know, just an email and you respond when you get emails back or, you know, you always follow up an email with another question or whatever it may be, or, um, I would have our interns, you know, at the very beginning, they would, they would write down all the coaches that they've ever played for, worked with or knew directly, you know? And so a lot of times they don't think that that high school baseball coach could help them out yeah. in the coaching world. But I mean, coaching worlds, I mean, you're, you're a couple of degrees of separation from almost anybody. Exactly. You know, you never know who's going to help you. Uh, yeah. Get job. You know, it's a creating some sort of, almost like Christmas newsletter where you're constantly sending it out to everybody just saying what's going on in your life. That's a, such an important thing to stay connected. And it can't be this, this quid pro quo where you, you know, they do something for you. So you do something for them or you, you're going to do something for them and they then expect something back in return. You mm -hmm. just got to do, you just, you give, give, give. And uh, one of these days you'll get back, you know, yeah, and uh, it's not no big deal. You didn't hurt anything. Um, but it's an important part of the process for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, Aubrey, we end the show with some resources here. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. I've ever received. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, I mean, on this, on this networking piece, I mean, Matt Shaw from University of Denver gave me probably the best advice I'd ever heard, which um, at the time I had applied to be one of his assistant strength coaches. Didn't get the job, obviously. But he's like, I know you have a network and I know that you know people and I know that people would talk very highly of you, but nobody called and I just didn't feel like you really, really, truly wanted this job. And he goes, it's so hard to turn down somebody when you've got 20 people emailing, calling and telling you, you have to hire this person. And so that was an absolute um, great thing that he, I mean, great piece of advice he shared because I mean, when I got this job, my current boss, he told me like, there's two recommendations that like people called and they were like, I was like, I can't not hire this person before he even interviewed me. He knew he wanted to hire me. 
based off of like two of these recommendations. And then afterwards, he saw, you know, all the various people that reached out on my behalf. And he said that it really showed um, the diversity that uh, I had, as well as, you know, my ability to, to build strong relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Got to gotta create your army, right? Yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. That's all right. That's all right. Busy woman. Love it. <laughs> what about a uh, book, app, and website recommendation? So book, we I just finished up um, The One Thing by Jay Papasan and Gary Keller. And uh, that one really was eye-opening. When um, I mean, you can kind of, you can basically understand the summary by reading the title, the one thing. So it's like you, it's like, what can you do today that will like, or today, this week, this month, this year, like what's the one thing that you're focusing on that's going to make everything else easier? You know, whether it's like your life purpose, your, you know, what you want to produce better work, you want to create a better culture, improve your relationships. It's like, what is the one thing you're focusing on? that will get you to where you want to go. That's awesome. Yeah. And the app, uh, website? Yeah. Website, um, we just finished up this course called How to Coach Kids, and there is a website on there, howtocoachkids.org, which um, we developed with Nike and Play. <laughs> And it's, I mean, they've got some, we've got some amazing resources on there of giving kids, how to give kids a great experience in sport. It follows, you know, uh, the American development model and long-term athletic development. And then it's got sports specific resources, topic specific, audience specific. And so all kinds of good stuff on there that we've been working on. Um, yeah. And then for apps, to kind of follow the um, trying to keep myself on the one thing and focused and driven is uh, Trello. I've been using a lot for my project management, um, personal stuff like to do's and then projects working here at the USOC. Um, but then also kind of coming back to that well-being part, I use Calm, the meditation app every day. So whether I do want to you know get out of the office and do a walking meditation for just 10 minutes or you know, listen to a sleep story to wind down before bed. That's been helping a lot. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, like I said, I've, I've known you for quite some time now. I've just always been impressed with the job that you do, how you, how you carry yourself, not just as a professional with, as a strength coach, but also just as a person and, and building those true and authentic relationships. And that that's a skill, but it's also something that people work, you know, you have to work at to be good at and, and you're definitely great at that and I, I, you know I'm impressed to see uh, what you're doing at the USOC and, and just uh, proud to know you proud to call your friend yeah well thank you so much Tom. I really appreciate it that's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk Thanks to this week's guest, as well as our sponsors, for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com, where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shop Talk.